And off we go. Um, Haskell. So first, I will wave my hands a little bit because this theme will kind of um, reappear. So when, when we think about um, Haskell and functional programming, it's a little bit different to the way we program imperatively. And also, um, it requires kind of a slightly different approach to problem solving. But uh, I posted like a short video about doing a sum in, um, uh, on, a, on a Discord. And at the end of the day, the programs get compiled. And at the end of the day, whether you wrote it in Java, C++, or Haskell, most of the time, the code which actually runs is exactly the same, right? So why does it matter? Why does it matter whether we use this particular approach or this if at the end of the day, the code is kind of the same? It matters because in some ways, solving problems is easier, right? So programming is like for humans. It's not for the machine to execute the code. It's for us to decompose and solve the problem. Um, so we kind of bear that in mind. We, we will kind of uh, reiterate over that later when we talk about state and when we talk about monads. But like, you know, the essence of imperative programming is that you need to get data from somewhere, from a variable. You have to do something and you kind of put it somewhere, right? And you're doing it each line of the code and the state is all over the place, right? It's kind of a very ad hoc programming in, in a sense because you have to get the data from somewhere, do something with it and store it somewhere. And now get this data, do something, put it here, put it here, put it there. And then maybe you at some point need four pieces of data. So you say, give me that, 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 and that, and then you do something and then you put somewhere, right? Object-oriented programming is trying to kind of enclose it into objects, but that kind of doesn't work because in each line of code, you can touch multiple objects and store things in multiple places, right? So it's kind of, um, you, you, you're doing programming, but you're doing this read, manipulate, and write kind of loop, right? And it's very inspired by how assembly programming works, right? We had to read stuff from register, do something, and put stuff into the register. So when we started programming, we kind of came from that, from that way of thinking, and that's what the imperative programming is all about. Um, so the essence of functional paradigm is really different. You don't do that. Like you think about transformations, you think about functions, especially pure functions. So you don't reading state from all over the place. You're thinking, okay, in, in my function, I'm gonna get something and I'm gonna produce something. And that's how you solve problems. That's, that's the essence of how you're actually building everything, including manipulating state. So we will learn later that, you know, state and Haskell is just functions. It, it, it is basically that. Um, so it may feel a little bit uh, abstract and it may not really click yet, but I wanted to say it upfront such that you will kind of, uh, we will come back to that later on. All right, so about the labs and about the course, um, it is very important that you try not to use things that you don't understand. Um, so understanding, let me just see where I do have my chat if I have any questions from people. So um, come on, come on, come on. All right, no questions yet. So when you're doing labs or where you're doing any programs, it's okay if your program is a little bit clunky or if you're not using the most efficient way. Like in lab one, some of you used recursion instead of map M, right? But map M is a very complicated construct. It's like, it took me literally like a year to kind of understand really what's going on, right? Uh, so if you don't understand something, just don't use it. Uh, just use something simpler. And the, the, the whole point is not to solve a puzzle, is not to have a running program. The whole point of this course is for you to understand what is happening, right? How the information flow, what is the program actually doing? So if your program doesn't work, I don't care. Like what I care is like you understanding what is happening, right? So try not to use any black boxes. Like if you're using something and you say, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know how it works, but it works. It solves my problem. That's, that's the wrong approach, right? We don't care about working code here. We care about your thinking, right? So uh, don't use construct that you, constructs that you don't understand. Um, and if you use some constructs, 
read about them and understand them, right? Even if it's just superficial, it will kind of sink in. Uh, and then ask questions. So if you if you saw a kind of a solution um, to something that is very nice and very concise, and you don't quite understand how it works, then pose the question on the on an issue tracker, right? Put a snippet and say, can somebody explain how this works, right? Uh, Haskell has like a lot of very complicated constructs and concepts that take a long time to kind of really grasp. And that's okay. Like, you know, we have time uh, and you don't need to use the very fancy ones from day one. Uh, we will repeat the same problems multiple times. So each iteration, you can solve it slightly better or slightly differently, right? And that's okay. Um, and talk with others. So I, I really encourage you to talk among yourselves and like look at each other code and so on. That's why we have the, the labs, which are kind of open. Uh, you can browse how different people did something and kind of learn from it. I'm looking into my code like from uh, previous years and I, I kind of learning from it as well. I, I see like that kind of is shit, like we could improve it. Uh, it's like not a nice way of solving something. So that's that's okay. We kind of learn from each other. Uh, so do this, uh, do treat it as a sort of um, team sport. And um, the important thing is that uh, people sometimes get attached kind of a, and personal about their code, right? Don't like code doesn't matter. Like if you wrote something that is ugly, that doesn't matter, right? Uh, just show it and 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 get feedback. Um, if you try to be personal about your code, you will not really do well in this industry, right? This industry is about you know reading other people' code, fixing it, pointing out to things, and learning from others. So you have to be open to that. Uh, so there is no wrong code or bad code is like just code which can be improved and whoever wrote it it kind of doesn't matter right um so so be kind of uh, open about this and don't take it personally right if if some if you did something and it can be done nicer it it has nothing to do with you as a person it, it is just about the code right so no no personal kind of emotions around it i know it's hard it takes a little bit of time. We get kind of personal about what we do, right? You spend six hours on something and you don't want to hear it shit, right? Uh, that's human nature, like it's normal. You just need to kind of uh, work on it yourself. It's your problem, right? Um, so I, I had the same issue, but it, you know, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> so the, the more you practice, the, the better it will be. All right, so changing slightly a topic, uh, a quick quiz. Uh, So we, we kind of did that since Corona and then we kind of observe like what is the changing pattern, like how people um, kind of react to that. Um, and, you know, when Corona started, a lot of people liked online lectures and we thought it's a good idea, but it turned out it's kind of a bad idea, right? So uh, our grades went down, like your grades went down, everything went down. Um, the bachelor thesis became a bit shit. Uh, so like things went downhill uh, so since we were teaching like uh, online for like two years. So for some people this may work or this may appeal, but I think the physical uh, environment kind of works a little bit better. All right, so that's uh, that's the kind of a this year data. Um, I, I'm kind of using it to to show, um, and other lecturers are doing the same. Uh, so some some departments like ECO, for example, they continue doing a lot of online lectures. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of a, as I say, there is no uh, single solution. Like some some things work better than than others. All right, so there will be uh, a small change in the in the course for the next two weeks. Uh, I'm working on an external lecturer to give uh, a talk, but or two talks. He gave some lectures last year about profiling and performance and um, debugging, uh, and it's very interesting. But he's in Oslo and he needs to drive here, so he cannot get here, you know, by by eight thirty. So I will check whether we can move it or whether the lectures will be online, right? So I prepared the next slide that the lectures are, are online, but it may not be. Like you need to check the wiki. And then if I get the class to be physical, then I will make, he will come 
uh, and then give the lectures physically. If he cannot do that, then he will kind of do it remotely. So that that's his his lectures, and then my lectures. I am away for three weeks, so I will post videos and I will be working online, but I will not physically be here. So contact with me be, will be kind of online. So we will have a little bit of a, a gap, like with the physical presence, unless I'm, I, I worked out with um, course coordinate uh, course scheduling that he can come and give the lectures a little bit later. So you will probably see it in the uh, team plan. Or I will, and of course I will post it on the wiki as well. So stay stay tuned, and I will post the announcements on the Discord and on the GitLab. All right, tooling. Um, so so the lecturer who is gonna give you the lectures, he's our past student. He did a bachelor with us and then a master's degree, and he's the guy who took the functional programming course in Trondheim, and he said, yeah, it's kind of it's okay, but I don't really get this kind of a functional thinking. So he's very much an imperative programmer. Uh, and he was fed up with the OS, which they used uh, as an example of a functional language because OS is a very academic language. Like Haskell is an academic language, but Haskell has a very real world kind of a feel and modern programming language feel. OS, I, I, I learned OS in my university before as well, and it is really academic. Uh, but the good thing about OS it's a very multi-paradigm uh, language. And one thing that I really like is the constraint programming. So in, in Haskell, you don't really have it, but they have like a solver, mathematical solver, such that you can uh, create constraints and then it infers what is like the solution to the constraints that you give it, right? So for example, if you're solving some problem, you can specify that you have certain data types with certain ranges and you have certain constraints. And then if you ask about something, it's a little bit like Prolog. I, I don't know if you know Prolog, uh, that it kind of in, you know invents what is missing, like based on the constraints. So we don't have like normal programming languages don't have that feature and OS has it. So I didn't like OS for the functional programming, but I liked it for the constraint programming. So coming back to, um, to Haskell, Haskell, I don't think has that problem. I think Haskell is, uh, it has a very modern programming language feel. So we have JT up for setting everything. We have IDEs, we have REPL, and then we have Hugo. Hugo is your friend. Like every time you are missing something, you can ask Hugo. And Hugo is also quite cool because, uh, let me show you. So if you, If you go to Hugo and you know there is a function, but you don't know the name of the function, but you know the type of the function, you can ask based on the type, right? So I actually, I was looking for a function which swaps the arguments, which, which, I, th call, uh, which I thought is called swap, but swap uh, swaps the elements of the tuple, right? So, so swap swaps the elements of tuple, but what I wanted is this, I wanted a, a function which given a function which has a and b as an arguments uh, returns b and a something like this right um, so it takes a and b and returns c and then it does yeah it does something like like this So unfortunately that one doesn't give us any results. <laughs> so I need to unclose that in quotes. No, doesn't seem to work, but <laughs> in general, you can kind of specify the type of something. So if you know like a function takes a list and returns a list, then it kind of gives you all the functions which have that signature, right? Um, so you can kind of do a little bit of a search. Anyway, what I was looking for is a function flip. So flip, yeah, I wrote that. Uh, no, I, I did the tuple, right? I, I put the uh, round bracket here, which was wrong. So um, flip is a kind of a, an interesting function. We don't have it like in normal programming languages because we cannot reorder 
uh, parameters to our functions like in C or Golang, right? I cannot say I want a, a, another function which kind of uh, rotates the parameters, but in Haskell, you can do that. We, we're gonna talk about it in, in a moment. All right, so then Hugo. Hugo is your, is your friend and you should, um, should use it. And then taking notes and uh, using a pen and paper is also a very good idea. Uh, I work with many programmers like in the, uh, in the industry and um, I actually didn't use that technique uh, until very late. Like maybe I was like 30 or 35 uh, because I've noticed like uh, people sit in, in front of the computer, they have a kind of a notebook and a pen and they kind of uh, make kind of a mental um, notes of where they are in the stack, like what they were doing just before when they press compile and what they kind of are doing next and kind of are having kind of a, a mental help uh, using a pen and paper. And I, I didn't use it myself, but I've seen like two people in, in our company doing it and I started doing it and I kind of loved it, right? It's, it's a really good uh, practice to, to do uh, just with a pen and paper. All right, so how are you set up? How is the state of the class? Are you set with everything? So that is looking pretty good. Uh, if you're not set up yet um, and you're having some trouble, put, make questions in the issue tracker. So there might be other people who have similar problems and um, might uh, experience similar things. There is sometimes some annoying warnings in uh, IntelliJ about REPL and so on. Uh, most of the time I just ignore it. Uh, there is also a little bit annoying that sometimes um, IntelliJ doesn't set everything correctly. And it says, for example, that your project built, you go to stack and your project doesn't build, right? So I kind of don't trust it. Uh, I, I generally don't trust IDs usually. So I kind of do like double check things using stack, okay? Um, so we will, we will see it in a moment. Um, all right, great. Um, so functions, function patterns, function guards. We had it last time in the lab. If expressions let in, let also, and where case brackets and uh, dollar sign. I discussed it a lot last time. And then function composition with calling functions and with the dot operator. Um, so, and then carrying. Carrying, we, we're gonna talk about today. So how how about everything but carrying? How do you feel? Well, more or less okay? Not yet. Um, this you need to know, like all of those things, you kind of need to know without looking up because if you have to look them up, it will really slow you down, right? So you kind of need to understand how the function type is specified and how you write functions and how you're using where, if expression case and so on, because if you don't remember that, then you have to go to a book or go to a online resource and kind of check it. And we use it like all the time, right? So you kind of need to memorize this. Um, there are some things you kind of need to memorize in any programming language, like in Golang, this, it's the same. And some of those things you will memorize just by doing, right? So by doing labs, the, all those things will become kind of easier. There is no rocket science here, it's just syntax, right? So I, I think you are familiar with most of those things. Maybe not familiar with the pattern matching, like the uh, destructuring and pattern matching is a little bit new because you didn't have it in other programming languages. But other than that, it, it's most of it, I think is just syntax. So if there is something fundamentally difficult, the carrying is for sure. So we're gonna spend some time now discussing it, but the rest, anyway, if you have some problems, then uh, you have to post questions on the, on the issue tracker. So pattern matching and destructuring. It is one of those new elements, right? Um, so pattern matching is like when we have uh, two sides or we have kind of a guard in our function or we have the function specification and we matching variables to some values, right? So, for example, when we when we have um, 
like when we have we we writing function fun, and the function fun uh, takes uh, a, a list, and let's say it produces an int. Let's say it takes a list of ints and produces an int. And then what we do is uh, we say fun of empty list gives us uh, a empty list, right? So we say that's the first definition and that's the first pattern. And then we say fun of a list with a single element gives us this element. Now we cannot give empty list because we're returning in. So let's return zero, right? And then if we have fun of the head followed by the tail, we return the head, right? So this is like pattern matching here on the arguments which is, which is passed to fun. And then those variables here gets substituted, replaced with whatever is being passed to, to fun, right? So that's kind of a, an example of pattern matching. We have pattern matching in, in case expressions. We used the pattern matching last time. Remember when we did the case uh, of um, a number modulo, modulo three, and uh, and modulo five, remember this? And we say off, and then we had patterns here saying we have we don't care about something and zero, right? That's also pattern matching because this tuple then is matched against those those patterns here, or we can have a variable here, right? And then this variable becomes whatever was kind of in the in the case statement. So, I mean, th there is no rocket science here. It's just a little bit of a um, syntax for dealing with like substitution, right? The easiest form like Golang has this structuring, right? So Golang has this uh, construct like saying, I have a number and an error, and then I'm getting fun to return me a number or an error, right? So fun, um, we have fun, fun, and fun returns two things. It, it returns an int and an error, right? And then we destructuring what fun returns and substitute the n with the int and e with the error, right? So it's kind of destructuring. Uh, destructuring is very common. Uh, you, you, I, um, in Rust. They use this quite a lot as well, and uh, they do this pattern matching in some expressions too. So those are kind of useful. Uh, so those of you who don't have idea what I'm talking about, then re-analyze the previous lab, like how we were doing certain things with the structuring, um, and check in the books, right? And if, if it's still something you don't understand, then pose the question in the issue tracker. All right, we have some uh, some quizzes. Not many, four. All right, so let's go. If then else is, okay, we talked about it a lot. So that should be easy. Oh, come on, people. <laughs> it's a statement in normal programming languages, but in the kind of fancy programming languages is an expression. Um, the difference is that expressions are much more uh, friendly for programming. You can put them everywhere, right? Uh, statements are not. Statement occupies a line of code, and that's it. You cannot put it anywhere you want. Uh, so expressions are a little bit more robust because they fit everywhere. Um, all right, we. I hope it will be improved. <laughs> all right, so knowing that it is an expression, you do understand how it works. <laughs> Partially, all right. So, um, okay, 
remember the difference between expression and statement. The difference is statement doesn't like you cannot assign. I cannot assign like in Golang. I cannot assign A to a statement, right? Statements don't have value. They don't evaluate to something you can pass around. They are doing things, but you cannot assign it. Expression you can, right? Expression you can assign to something, right? So if I have uh, now, let's say I have let, that's Haskell now. So I have let A equals, and then I have an if expression. Then I have a condition, and then I'm saying then, and then I have a true value. So I return this true value if the condition is true, else false, false value, right? And uh, the values are actually not values, they are expressions themselves, right? So I can nest expressions in other expressions because in here, in those two places, I can put another expression, right? Um, in programming languages where if statement is a statement, you're not putting expressions there, you're putting other statements there, right? So you're saying, if true, do this, right? So if itself is do this, uh, if true, you're doing those things. If false, you're doing those things. But here, a uh, true value expression is an expression. So it says, you know, calculate me a value and then the if will return it. So if the condition is true, this will be returned and A becomes this. If the condition is false, this is evaluated to a value and A becomes this, right? Because um, Haskell is lazy, the true expression actually is not evaluated at all. It's just assigned to A. And when I need A, the expression will be evaluated. So this doesn't do anything, right? In normal imperative programming, the condition is gonna be evaluated and the true branch, if condition was true, is gonna get evaluated. But here, only condition is evaluated. Uh, you are, in fact, Haskell is so lazy that it even doesn't evaluate the condition either, right? It just says, well, you know, I know A is this if, you know, whenever we will need A, I, I will kind of do it, right? So it doesn't evaluate anything at that point. At this line of code, nothing gets evaluated. What happens is A becomes this expression, right? And that's it. And then the program continues, right? All right. Okay, another test. That that helps me to um, to plan like how how fast can we move? So where? What is where in Haskell? <laughs> Almost, right? I mean, uh, it's not really an expression and it's kind of looks a little bit like a statement, but kind of it's, it's not really a statement because it cannot live in its own line of code, right? You kind of need to have it together with something else. So it is kind of a function definition construct. So it's like a syntax sugar for making some kind of a definition of functions a bit easier. So in where um, you're kind of defining all the things that haven't been defined in the function body, right? So it's kind of a simple, um, simple, if I have fun function and I'm saying, you know, some code, some lines of code here, uh, and then I'm using a symbol, like I'm, I'm doing like a sum, um, some ballots, right? I'm summing over some ballot thing and I'm calling it. And then I can do where, and I can say some ballots equals, and I can define it, right? So it's sort of like, uh, it defines all the symbols that you are using in your body, which are not defined yet. It's kind of like you... You know, normally in, in imperative programming, we define all the variables up front and then we use them. And here you're kind of doing it upside down, right? You, you're using variables and then you're saying, oh yeah, by the way, I have to explain to you what I meant. And you're kind of saying what those variables were and you're doing kind of one variable at a time, right? So if, we, if you're using some, some variables here or some functions, 
then you can define them here, like another one and so on. So it's like a syntactic sugar for helping you to define symbols that you don't know. And then, you know, what happens to the syntactic sugar is the right hand side is going is being used everywhere you've used it, right? So it's just like a rewrite, and then this right hand side becomes what you were using up there. Okay. So another question. Case. All right. So 100% correct answers now. Please. <laughs> We've used it in lab one, right? How did you use it in lab one? Perfect. Very good. We've used it as an expression because we said our function will be this value based on the case expression, right? It's the same as with if, uh, exactly the same. But this one is a bit more fancy because you have this pattern matching and this structuring, right? So you can use it like uh, in a little bit more fancy ways. All right, so Elsa kicks, kicks S this time. And Haskell Sachs also is really good. <laughs> good. All right, so next. Oh, one more. Okay, this one is tough. In Haskell, function type declaration is compulsory. Is it? Those of you who read the book can, can answer this. If you haven't read the book, we didn't talk about it yet. So, very good, perfect. It is not compulsory, but you should always do it, right? So it's like a, just a contract between you and your future you to help you understand what you were writing. So Haskell is really good in inferring uh, type. It's kind of like using auto everywhere in C++, right? Uh, most of the time the compiler will infer. Um, sometimes it will not, and it will ask you, what do you mean? Same in, in Haskell. If you don't use it, Haskell most of the time will infer it or use a default type, but sometimes it will get confused and then the error message is like, you, you're gonna kill yourself when you see it, right? Um, so always do this. Uh, it's for documentation purposes and just for making sure Haskell and you are on the same page, because if you don't do it and Haskell infers a different type, then you will have a kind of unpleasant surprise, right? Uh, but if you tell Haskell, I mean this, then you are on the same page, right? All right, so then let's let's move on. Um, uh, very slight change. Yeah, so Haskell sucks wins this time. <laughs> Okay, short programming exercises. Because uh, we are kind of in this environment, it's a little bit hard to make, make a lab. So hello world, we've done it, um, but I wanted to kind of redo it like with the full um, run through the tools, right? Is this legible? You can read it, too small. How about this? Better? All right, so if I were to start a new project in, um, in, in Haskell, I would use stack. Um, so my workflow is I would say stack, new, hello world, I already have it. So I will say hello, okay? And then it will generate a kind of a, a based on the default template that will generate a folder for me. So as you can see, it's generated a folder hello. And then inside there is a kind of a directory structure and the app contains main. It's like a main entry point. Uh, and it's like main.haskell. Um, and then in source, we have our libraries or modules. And we kind of use them, use the name to be the same as the module that we have inside. Um, and then we have a test specification. So, we're gonna look into it in a moment. And then we have a couple of configuration files. Most of the most of the things you configure in the package.yaml. Uh, so that's the file that you configure most of the things. Sometimes you do need to touch stack.yaml. 
but most of the time, this one is enough. And then the rest is, this file is generated based on those two files for you. So you usually you don't touch it by hand. Um, setup, usually you don't touch by hand neither. Uh, and then you have the text files like, you know, a change log, license, and readme, right? So that the kind of a fluffy uh, programming, you know, um, things that you often have in projects. So then I would kind of code here, but if you, if you want to use an IDE, you would start IntelliJ. And then in, in IntelliJ, there is kind of a button says new project, but you don't click that button. Uh, you get into trouble if you click that button. So what you do is you click this button and you say uh, new, and you say new project from existing sources. Um, I don't know why those two things work differently, but they do, and you have to do this one. Uh, so then you say project from existing sources, you pick your folder and you say open, and then it will ask you, oh yeah, it asks me here. It will ask you, oh, come on. Are you, is your project uh, from Haskell stack? And you will say, yes, it's Haskell stack. And then you will click next. And then it will ask you for your compiler, if, uh, for your stack installation. If this one is wrong, or if this one is not kind of uh, proper, you have to edit. So you have to find where your stack executable is, and then you have to kind of set it here. If you do this step wrong, then everything else is wrong as well. Um, and then you say create. And that will be, uh, and then it will open uh, a project for you. Uh, it will have some helps. It will tell you about the, um, all the plugins that are not working anymore. So then you have this kind of a structure. And as I said, in app, you have your main and that's your entry point. You try to keep it kind of clean, like uh, small and simple. Uh, so usually you have some function which you kind of call in main, but everything goes into the lip, right? So that's what happens here. In the lip, we have um, some function which prints, you know, some function, we can change it and say, uh, hello world, perfect. And then um, if we save it, then um, it says I can add everything to Git and then you don't change anything here. So here you can see that we have a de declaration of the main module and we exposing a file, uh, a function main to the outside, okay? That will be kind of useful in a moment. Uh, and we importing all the function which are exposed in the lib. So in lib, we are saying we have a module lib and we exposing some function, right? So if I add another function, so I will add another function called hello. And this function is also IO uh, empty. And I will say hello equals put string line hello. Then in my library, I have two functions, but I'm exposing only one. So if I try to call hello here, it should complain. Right. So it should say, oh, yeah, uh, uh, wiggly red wiggly thing. It says, um, Warning, variable not in scope, right? So the, the, the symbol hello is not in scope for this function, for, uh, for this module here, uh, because lib doesn't expose it, right? So if I go to lib and change, um, oh, let's say um, the, um, I have some func, and then I will say I also expose hello, right? So we usually, uh, it's comma separated list of all the symbols that you want to make public outside of the module. Uh, in Golang, we just capitalize the function and then it gets automatically exposed. Here you have to do it manually, right? Uh, so it, it, it is actually kind of tedious sometimes to expose all, all the things, but you kind of doing it explicitly. It's like, you know, in C. So now everything works and then uh, this, did I save it? Yeah, I saved it. it the wiggly scribble is uh, gone. 
And then I can go here and I can say edit configurations. And I, I usually configure all three. So I usually go plus, uh, and then you have three options. You have Haskell stack REPL, you have the runner or the tester, right? So let's do the, the REPL first. So I will pick that I want the REPL. I will um, rename it to hello REPL. And then you just apply and do OK. And then I, when I'm you know, declaring those things, I will um, edit configurations one more time and add a runner. So then I will say stack runner and I will rename it to uh, hello run and then okay it. So now I have this option either to run it and if I press run, it will build it and run it for me. So what we should see, we should see like all the building and we have now hello printed out or I can change and I can run REPL. Um, so I change to REPL. I run the REPL and then that's very useful because it loads the GHCI for you with all the modules and all the definitions already loaded up and then you can play with it. So you can ask, okay, uh, can you tell me, uh, can you tell me about uh, some, some funk? And it sort of tells me, yeah, there is a some funk defined and it is of the IO type, right? Um, so, and I can call it, right? I can actually run some funk and then it will do it. It says hello world. If I write hello, it will write it and it will write hello. And if I run main, it will run the main function of the program, right? So you can kind of interactively play with it. And then if you change it, if you, um, uh, yeah, so variable is uh, main, yeah, variable is not in scope. So it only loaded if you, uh, the main should be loaded. It doesn't know about main. Nope, main is not in scope. So can you load? Uh, was it called ape and main? Can you tell me about main? Yeah, so it, it loads the lip and everything you have in source, but it doesn't load the app main. You kind of need to load it manually. So then if you want to load something separate, you, you say load. If you changed, like if we change the main to uh, use some funk instead, so I'm using this one now and I saved it and you are here and you want to reload, you just say uh, reload. And then it reloads everything. And then if I call main now, I will have a hello world instead of hello, right? So that's how I use it. Um, and then you use com uh, um, comments uh, and the comments is, um, construct is like this. And then, you know, uh, main entry to, our amazing app, right? Uh, so you, you do this kind of a bar and that generates like a documentation for your code. If you want just a comment, uh, then you may go without the bar. And that is a normal comment in Haskell, but it's not used for documentation. So the Haddock, which is like the documentation generator will not use those comments. It will only use the comments which, uh, which have a bar. Okay, so that is pretty nice and cool. Um, I will close this project and I will show you something uh, which I already um, um, did. So hello world. Okay, so in the Git repo, you have a hello world uh, project. And the hello project is um, with some methods, like with the... Um, yeah, like print hello and all that, uh, but it has kind of examples. And the example is how can you write tests for your functions inside your um, the, the documentation that you're writing for your for your functions. So as you can see, um, is it legible or is it too small? Yeah, let me let me make it. 
slightly bigger. So let's go 22. All right, so you can see I have a swap with tick. Uh, the tick is kind of a, a idiomatic way of redefining something that is already defined in the language, right? So if you want to write your own sum, you usually you say sum tick, or uh, in this case, we are redefining swap, right? There is a swap already in the language which swaps the, uh, the tuple. It's, it's just kind of a redefinition of the, uh, of the swap. So swap tick basically swaps the, uh, the tuple elements, right? I have a tuple of two things and then it swaps them around. Uh, and the, the, you know, the definition uses this structuring, right? So I destructured the tuple, which is passed as an argument into two variables. And I, I return a new tuple, which has the two variables swapped, right? Uh, so it's one of the very simple way of um, uh, changing it, right? We could uh, define swap in a kind of a swap tick in a more imperative way saying swap takes a tuple T, okay? And it returns a new tuple which has a second argument of T as a first one and first argument of T as a second one, right? That would be an equivalent definition of swap using the kind of a more imperative way of what to do, right? Not what it is, right? Uh, this one says, you know, pass me a tuple and, you know, that's what will be the around, right? It, it uses pattern matching and the structuring instead of like uh, doing a traditional parameter passing and then doing something with the parameter, right? Um, so this one is much more Haskell than this one, but both are the same and they both get compiled to the same code, right? It, it's, it is the same thing. Um, all right, so then you can see that I have uh, examples and I, I am calling my swap and saying, do this and I expect this as a result, do this, and I expect this as a result, right? And those are kind of executions that you can do in, uh, in your comments, such that the, when you run your tests, it will check if your function does what you think it will do. And it's a good idea to write this before you even write your function, right? Um, one extra note, uh, you will see that I have this kind of a nice arrow, right? So if I, if I type, um, if I type uh, dash, uh, uh, bigger than symbol, it makes this kind of a nice arrow instead of dash bigger than symbol. You can configure it by changing the settings. And then if you go to font and you enable ligatures, you're gonna have it. If I disable it, uh, you will see that I am back to normal minus and uh, greater than. Uh, but if you kind of if you like this, you can you can enable that, and it makes editing a little bit more um, pleasant for your eyes. So, for example, this one, right? It uses the lig ligatures um, instead of the equality sign and uh, more than sign. So, how you get this to work? Well, then in your spec, um, you have to have you have to have this doc test line um, and inside your stack in inside your package YAML, you have to have this line, right? So if you do those two changes, then you can write uh, tests inside your uh, documentation and they will run the moment you run your tests. And I do have a target which is called test. And if I run it, um, I, I will come back to it in a minute. Um, what are you complaining? Okay, warnings about some... Yeah, anyway, uh, there are some warnings, but if you look into the deadline, it says you have 23 examples. I tried them all and you have no errors and no failures, right? So all my examples work. If I go to lib and I say uh, that worlds, 
okay, for example. And then I rerun the tests. It will say, Okay, so you have 23 examples. He tried 23 and we have one failure. And then the failure is that it was expected to get worlds, hello, uh, but the program one, while executing that test got world, hello, right? So it tells you like, okay, something is not right. Something is either your test is wrong or your method is wrong. All right, so that's about documentation. And you do need to have this bar for this test to work this way, okay? Uh, how useful is that? It's super useful. I, I use it all the time, right? Uh, because when you're writing a new function and you want to make sure that it does what you think it does, you write those tests, little couple of tests, and then your test harness will always catch if you miss something or if something is not right. So that's super useful. All right, so then we revisited Hello World with all the tool chain. You did it for lab one, so I, I'm not gonna dive to that. Uh, let's, let's try to do this one. So given a list of three numbers, uh, show them as a comma separated row, right? Um, and how would you do that? There are different ways of doing this. Uh, I will show you how I've done it last year uh, as a demonstration of uh, list access. Uh, one extra caveat here. Uh, sometimes um, you want a list to be constrained to, to three, right? But you can't really do that. Like uh, you can do it, but it's like super complicated to, to achieve this. So usually if you need a list which is restricted to three numbers, you have to have some guards kind of are catching the condition if you've got a list which is less or more than three, right? Um, so usually, it's not worth trying to constrain your type system to say that the list is only three elements. You're gonna deal with lists which are more or less, but if your list is kind of a correctly uh, prepared, it will only have three elements, right? Um, so if we have a look here, um, so no, 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 no. No, I actually don't have it here. Let me see. No, I don't have it. So let's do it. So um, I will have, um, no, there is a swap. Yeah, but this swap is only for tuples. So swap three, three int. Um, what is it says? Um, yeah, so when it says numbers, it's kind of, you have to decide uh, what are the numbers? Do you want to deal with num or do you want to deal with particular numbers? Uh, we probably don't care. So we can probably use just generic type instead, right? So if we don't care, we say um, swap uh, first and last element of three num list. And then we're going to have some examples. So if I pass it uh, swap three and I pass it a list of one, two, three, I'm going to get what? Three, two, one. Okay, when you write tests, how many tests do you need to run, write? Yeah, in this particular case, one will be okay because if it swaps those, then it means it, it works. Usually you want also to kind of uh, check edge conditions. What if, you, if, what if our method gets something that is invalid, right? So what if I go, if I call it with uh, swap three and I pass an empty list, what should we expect? Well, we don't expect the program to crash. So let's say we expect an empty list, right? And another one, if we call it with swap three, but we only pass one element, what do we expect then? It's up to us, right? We define the what, what is the behavior of the kind of edge condition. Maybe we also expect an empty list. And then if we pass it, um, 
if we pass it swap three and we pass it um, four elements. So one, two, three, four, what do we expect then? Maybe we also say, you know, all errors, we just return an empty list. We, we, it is kind of uh, suggesting that something went wrong, right? Okay, so then uh, signature of our method, um, of our function is swap three. And what does it take? It takes a list of some sort and returns a list of some sort. Do we need to constrain the type? Do we care what is inside the list? No, it's a totally generic function, right? So then we need to define it. So swap three, and now we have to write the body. So the first one is, is easy. Like uh, we could say, if we get an empty list, we return an empty list, right? But you can see a small problem with this uh, approach because we have to have a case for one, two, three of, or more elements. And then we have to deal with the three in special special way and with all the others in special way, right? So it's a little bit easier instead of writing pattern matching like this is to write a guard, right? So we will say, we, we're gonna get a list um, and we gonna check, um, so we're going to check uh, if L, if length of L is different. Um, is it like this way? Is different than three. So if the length is different than, than three, we're going to return um, an empty uh, Otherwise, what are we doing? Otherwise, we have to uh, get the first element to the third position and then the third position element to the first one, right? So we kind of are creating a new list uh, and we can do it in, a, um, um, in different ways. But one, one kind of an easy way is we say, we're gonna get L and we're gonna get the third element. Um, yeah, the third element to the first position. And we're gonna put um, the, that element in the middle as it was. And we're gonna put this element into the last position. So that would work if I got the syntax right, but I didn't. Um, so anyone sees where the problem is? Yeah. Perfect. So then we are gonna save it and we are gonna run our tests and Let's see if it compiles. It doesn't. Uh, multiple declaration of swap three. Shit, so I did have it, but I didn't seen it. Okay, so we have the swap, we have the sum, we have the thinking uh, in three. Swap three, yes, we do have it. Um, so I did, I already did it. I did it slightly differently. I used the destructuring. You see, I kind of destructured the, uh, the, the actual list, which is being passed, uh, by doing this kind of where close. Um, so yeah, both, both ways will work. So let's call this one old. Uh, and now I have to change all those old. The old one is better, right? It is a little bit nicer to old. All right, so let's save it. Let's rerun it. 
Perfect. So it works. It, it is doing the tests and we have no errors. So we have 27 examples and our implementation works, right? But as I said, the implementation is very uh, imperative. It, it kind of feels a little bit ugly. And the other implementation, which is using this structuring, is, is much better. Um, and the, the clever way of doing this destructuring is that we haven't destructured the actual ar argument here. We can do it later, right? And you can always do that. You can always do that later by either doing a where close or doing a let. So if I were to kind of destructure L into a list of three elements, I would say I have A, B, and C, and it's L is equal to that, and I would do let, right? So you can either destructure into A, B, C here like this, or you can do that in the where clause where the uh, variables are on the left hand side and L is on the right hand side. Does that make sense? Maybe, yeah, it's a little bit of a new construct. It's, it's very useful. Once you get used to it, you will love it. Um, but it may take a, a while because you didn't use this, this structuring so heavily in, uh, in C or, or any other programming language that you know probably. So anyway, uh, that works fine. Uh, we leave it there. Uh, and we have our uh, test case and we have our uh, method kind of uh, tested using the um, uh, tested using the documentation. But we also can test it using unit tests, right? So there is a, a mechanism for doing unit tests. And again, I already committed it in, into the spec. Um, you write tests. Um, we're using hspec and hspec. So this one, uh, it's kind of a very nice wrapper over the uh, generic unit testing framework of Haskell. Uh, and it allows you to write test cases like this. You write a test case and the test case type is spec. And then you use describe and you can kind of a nest describes um, into blocks. Uh, and then once you do this, uh, you can write the actual, uh, it, uh, like the, the test cases, right? So for example, we say if um, it works for two and three, and then you say, you call your method, you do the calculations, and then you say what it, the result should be. And you have some keywords, you can use should be, or you can do more than, or some, you know, you have the, the typical um, unit testing framework, keywords that you can use here. So here we are testing swap uh, and we're testing it for um, two use cases here, right? Uh, Haskell has an extra thing, right? So if you look at the swap, uh, it doesn't care what it swaps. Like uh, it doesn't care what type is on the left side and on the right side of the tuple, right? So it should work for anything, right? We're testing it on int here and uh, here, but and on int and, and string, but in fact, it should work on any types. And it should also work on any values that we have here and here, right? So normally, if you're writing unit test and kind of imperative programming language, what you do is you have kind of a loop, you generate a lot of examples, you generate a lot of numbers and kind of a strings, and then you test if it works for all those things, right? But Haskell can do that for you. So instead of you generating the case cases for your tests, a Haskell can do it for you and it's called um, property checking, right? We're checking if the particular property is uh, constructed correctly. So then for using the property checking and uh, HSpec, you need to include those two extra includes in your test dependencies. So for your test dependencies, you include doc test, quick check and HSpec. And in your specs, uh, you write, sorry, in your specs, you write a property test, which looks a little bit different than your normal tests. So your normal tests, you call your method 
with arguments that you pass into the method, into the function, right? So you, you, this, you design what argument I want to test it with, and you pass those two arguments yourself. But with this one, you generate a Lambda function, and then you call your, your function, which you are testing, with the parameters which are from this Lambda function. So you passing X and Y, uh, and the X and Y will be generated for you by, by Haskell testing framework. So it will generate a lot of numbers and a lot of strings, and it will test your method that it works as expected, right? Um, so in this particular case, uh, we passing X and Y, we calling X and Y into our swap, and we expect them to be swapped around, right? It's kind of a trivial use case, but if we run the tests, you will see that we have, um, so if we look into our tests and we have the two first ones. So we have uh, works for two and three, works for two and three, tick, um, handles test case of different types, handle test case of different types, ticked. So those are two, those two tests. And then it says actually handles any case you throw in exa example string int. So it's this one and it says it passed and it tried hundred different tests, right? So it generated hundred different pairs of number and string for us and tested all of it uh, automatically. So that's super useful for like, um, you know, brute force testing for things that may fail. And it's quite clever in generating them, right? So it will generate use cases with zero, with negative numbers, positive numbers, with strings which are short, which are empty, and so on and so forth. Um, so it kind of tries to um, cover the possible space of the domain and generate the tests for you, right? So this is like super, super useful construct. So you already have it. I don't kind of imagine you need to remember it by heart. You can look it up in the repo, do those two includes in your project, and then um, follow this pattern to write your own tests. But from experience, the best way for doing the unit test is actually the documentation testing because it's kind of less typing, right? Here, look, I've tested two cases and I typed like, you know, gazillion of characters, right? In the documentation, it was just call me this function, this should be the result, call me this, this is the result, right? It's so much easier to do unit testing in the doc. Um, but for property testing, it's super useful. So I usually just do property testing here and I do unit testing as a documentation instead, uh, just to save on typing. All right, so that was uh, given the three numbers, um, show them as comma, se comma separated row and then swap them, right? So we did the swap and now show them as a comma separated row. Um, how would you do that? How would you show them as a comma separated row? Well, I've already done it as well, uh, as it turns out, which is this um, print. Um, let me find it. Yeah, it's this one. So you pass it uh, a list of three numbers and you expect it to get uh, that result, right? So if you pass it with an empty string, it returns nothing. And if you pass it with uh, less than three, it returns an empty string as well. And the way we're doing it is like this, which is ugly like hell, right? Uh, we extracting the first element, we extracting the last element, and we extracting the first element. So, so by doing first, I mean the middle element here. Uh, the indexes go from zero, like in any array, right? So the first element is index zero. So, uh, how ugly is that? Yeah, it's kind of really ugly, right? But it works, and it it passes all the tests, right? And that's one way of doing it. It's a kind of a very imperative thing, like you converting the first element to a string, you're concatenating it with comma space, you're taking the middle element, converting it to string and so on. But you see that kind of the pattern, right? So what is the pattern? Well, the pattern is uh, if we go to GHCI, um, 
Okay, let me do it on top. So if we go to GHCI, um, and if we have a list of uh, three elements, and eight, then what we're doing is we mapping show over our list. So that converts all the elements to strings, right? Um, so this is kind of like a, a single liner. Instead of three times calling show on each subsequent element, we just doing it like this. I will add, um, I will add data list. And then uh, what we need is we need to intersperse um, comma space into our map show L, right? To inject. So now we have one and then comma space, three comma space, eight, right? So we injected between our elements. We have a list of three elements here and we want in between the elements to have comma space, right? So then we have this, right? So then once I have this, I need to concatenate everything to a single string. So I, I will do concat, right? So now I have the, the list as I wanted to have, yeah? You can, yeah, you can. And then we want to print it, right? So we want to print it to a screen. So let's say we're doing print. All right. So if we did that, we achieved it without any kind of extracting the elements manually and doing kind of things, we automated everything, right? So this code works and this code kind of demonstrates like how we composing functions to achieve what we need, like how we actually did that. And it turns out it's just a single function, right? It is a single function, um, which, which does it because if you look at it, um, so I will say my P3, P3 is a function which does that. So I call it and it does that. But uh, if I say, I don't have L, right? P3 is, uh, um, P3 is a function which takes, Uh, let's see. So P3 is a function which takes L as a parameter, then it does it, right? It's And I composed P3 by composing my functions with this one lacking one argument, right? So the, the uh, right hand most function is mapping show over a list, but that list is not here. It becomes a parameter to P3, right? So P3 signature, is um, it takes a list of some sort of numbers, um, not necessarily numbers because it will work for any type and returns a string, right? That's the signature of P3. Um, and I composed it by composing four functions. So the solution is like composing four functions, right? And this one is much nicer. So let me take it. And let's go here and we have, and we say, better to do it this way. So int three string xs equals um, this and the xs is gone. So if I delete excess, the signature of this is in three string signature is still, it takes a list and produces a string, but this line 160 is in a point free notation. I don't pass this one parameter which the left hand side needs and I don't pass it here, right? But I could. So remember about point free. It, it is a little bit confusing, but I can have this argument here 
and here, but I don't need it to have it. And then I have a very clean uh, point free notation, which says, you know, uh, in three string takes one argument. There is a small difference between this function and this function. What's the small difference? The small difference is that this function works for arbitrary length of lists, right? I don't have a guard and I don't say only work for number for if the list is length three, right? It works for empty list. It works for list of one, of two arguments, three, four, and so on. It will always create a comma separated list of things, but for empty list, it will produce an empty list. For one, it will produce just one. For one, two, it will produce one comma two, right? So if you want it to only work for, uh, for three, you would have to add the guard here as well. Okay, I will commit that uh, after the class so you can kind of uh, re review it in more details. All right, so that was the, uh, the sw uh, swapping and showing them as a comma separated row. There is a little bit of a hack also. I, I will show you the hack. So the hack is our L, is our list of three numbers, right? Remember? So if, if you just print L, uh, it's this, right? So actually if you show L, if I, if I say L as string is show L, um, and now I want to show what, what LS is, uh, you have this, right? It is actually our solution but it has the stupid open bracket on the left-hand side and closing bracket on the right-hand side, right? So what you could do like a P3 uh, tick, uh, you could write a function which show what you pass. We, we're writing it in a point three notation. Oh, let, let's, uh, let's use the argument. So I, I will have argument L, I will show L um, and then I will print it. But before I can print it, I have to remove the first element, right? Um, from, from what I got. So how do you remove the first element? You get the tail, right? So we're gonna take the tail of this uh, and then we have to remove the last element, right? So how you get all the elements, but the last one, you called in it, right? So we could do, um, we could do this. Um, and now if I call P3 tick on our L, it also does that, right? But that's like really a hack, right? Uh, because, you know, show L is this. And then if I take a tail of that, it's the one without the opening bracket. And then if I take the init of that is everything, without the last element, right? Uh, so that's just hacking the way kind of uh, show L prints it as a comma separated thing, right? Yeah, don't do it this way. Cool, so um, we will skip that. It's already there. It's like a, all this kind of um, puzzle. Uh, it's just for you to know how you write the, the syntax for defining functions. We sort of covered that, and that function is already defined in the in the repo. Um, so, but you have to do this one, All right? So, think of a number. Um, you, we have to think of a number and then do these operations, like add one to it, square it, subtract one, divide by the number you first thought of, subtract the number you first thought of, and it will give us two, right? So this function will kind of always return two. So it's very good for property testing because you say, no matter which number you throw at it, the result should be two, right? Um, so what is the type? Like how, how would you define the type of, of that function? So think of a number and then we uh, adding one, uh, subtracting one and so on and so forth. So it feels we're doing uh, integer operations on it. it. It doesn't feel it should be a float, right? It kind of feels from the spec, it should be an integer. Yeah, perfect. So th this one is perfect. 
This one is thing takes an array of ints and returns an array of ints. No, we, we just have one single number, right? So this one is correct. So it takes an int and returns an int. This one is correct as well. Perfect. It should be called think. Um, very good. So then uh, write the body of the function. Yeah, don't, don't write it. Um, and then about testing, we already covered it, right? And that was the example to use the pet property testing such that you can test if it always returns two, right? So let's go to our tests and let's see if we wrote that test. If, if we didn't, you will have to write it yourself, right? So let's see if we have a test for think. Uh, no, we don't. So you, it, you can do it as an example, right? You can kind of rewrite this property test as an example and use think x as a, as a case. What is this syntax? What is the, the hell here going on? Uh, oops. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Well, this is a, just a Lambda function, right? It's a function without a name, right? So normally we write functions like F equals blah, blah, blah. And then we say F takes two arguments, A and B, and then blah, 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 like A plus B, right? But what if we don't want to name it? Like what if we don't want to have uh, F as a name, but we still want to define a function? Um, so we use kind of a syntax like this. Um, it, it kind of looks weird because this syntax looks, um, um, yeah, a, a little bit unusual, right? And in this particular case, it's even more confusing because this is a tuple. Uh, this is not, you pass parameters in brackets. It, we, we passing a tuple into the Lambda, right? So let's do a quick rewrite here. So here is an F defined in a normal way. So it's a function which adds two numbers. So if I say F two and three, we're gonna get five, fine. So we're gonna do F tick and we're gonna say F tick is a Lambda function, which takes two arguments, A and B. And I don't remember if you do need a comma and it returns A plus B, right? So F is a function which takes two arguments and returns the sum. And now if we call F tick, we also gonna get five, right? So no comma here uh, for specifying the arguments to our function. So this, this symbol uh, signifies like a no name function, right? Because if, if we're doing the name, the definition looks like this. If we're not having a name, the definition looks like this. And then we can assign it because defining a Lambda function is an expression. So we can assign it to a variable and our variable is F, F tick and then we can, we can call it. So again, you have to get used to it like, um, some languages have lambdas and some languages like uh, have this arrow notation for lambdas. Um, that's how it is in Haskell. Cool, so we covered testing very quickly, but you will spend some time um, at home. So unit testing with uh, HSpec, a uh, quick check for property testing, fantastic tool for doing generating use test cases for you and doing this kind of like, um, uh, automated tests for you, and then comments testing, which is super useful. I use it a lot. I use it everywhere uh, in all my functions. So then HSpec is a unit test with quick check together. So that is the package which has this nice syntax. If you had to write unit tests yourself uh, without this nice syntax, uh, you have to import HUnit and the syntax is different. But HSpec, most people use, use HSpec instead, right? It has this kind of a nice, nice syntax. So when I told you about black boxes, um, of course there are some exceptions, right? So if we look into the H spec, you, you have this dollar symbol here and you have this do here and you kind of nesting things. And then you have this it, which looks like a normal function. Uh, by the way, all of those are normal functions. 
but we are kind of composing them by the dollar sign that you already know, right? And then the only black box that you don't really understand yet is this do, uh, which is this monadic construct for doing kind of a stateful computations. So that's okay. If you don't understand how do works, that's okay. You, you can finish this course without really understanding how do works and that will be okay as well. So that's allowed black box, okay, for now. Uh, everything else you kind of know. Those are all just normal functions and the dollar sign, you know, it's like you're waiting for the right-hand side to evaluate, to pass it as an argument to the function, right? So there is no magic with the dollar, uh, but there is a little bit of magic with do uh, and that's okay. Uh, all the other syntax, like syntax for sum, you see here is the lambda with a single argument and it, it's passed for the sum. So we redefined our, our own sum and we wrote an invariant function which says whatever our sum gives, it should be the same as the built-in sum, right? The built-in sum should be the result of our, our own our def defined sum and that's the invariant. So no matter what we uh, generate here, and this single argument is actually a list. It's a list of numbers, right? So Haskell will generate different lists for us and it will check this invariant uh, for us. Cool, so testing, we've covered testing as well. Very quickly. So the final thing that we will do is uh, word count. So, um, Word count is just to demonstrate the I.O. and some of the useful things that we do with the um, with the um, func building functions, right? Mm -hmm. So what is word count? Um, okay, let's unfold this. Whoops. Uh, so if I go to my terminal and I have a file here, readme, so I can say, uh, word count read me and it gives kind of uh, three things it says how many lines do i have in this text file how many words do i have in this text file and how many characters do i have in this text file right so it counts lines words and characters right so if if we were to rewrite wc ourselves um we would have to do something like this right we'd have to open a file we have to iterate over all the of the lines of the of the code, uh, and then for each line we need to split it into words, and then we need to count the words, and then for each uh, um, uh, word we need to split it into characters and then count the characters, right? And then we'll have to think about the buffer size and like how we're reading it. Do we read the whole thing at once or re reading it line by line and things like that, right? So. Would you be able to do it in C++ without looking up the internet? It's kind of a little bit complicated, right? The, the bu management, buffer management and the splitting of the lines, uh, you would need to, I would probably need to look it up how, how you kind of do the, the splitting and the buffer management. Uh, I don't remember all of all of that. So if you say uh, here or here, yeah, if you say here, kudos, right? That means you've been doing it recently and you kind of remember all, all those things. That's pretty good. Would you be able to do it in Go? So, so as a homework, you can, uh, we, we can add like uh, a pre-lap Three lap to lap two, uh, which is like doing it in Golang. Um, so that's kind of a useful, uh, useful thing, right? And then in, um, I can I can definitely do it in in Haskell because in Haskell is trivial, right? Uh, in Haskell is trivial because you have uh, GHCI. I will not do it as a project. I'll just do it here quickly uh, because we're running out of time. So Haskell has kind of a useful abstractions. And one of the abstraction is called get content. Uh, get content is a function which gives you in a lazy way, whatever comes in the standard input, right? So I can, um, um, uh, contents, right? So I can run A 
And now I can start typing things. So I can um, uh, uh, type some text, end of line, another line, end of line, and then I do Control D to uh, quick uh, quit the uh, quit the stream. I shit get contents. I have to do. First line, second line. Ay, 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 I can't, I can't close the stream without killing the GCI. Anyway, you get the idea, right? So, um, uh, come on. Clear. So, get contents gives you uh, everything that you pass in, into standard input. And then if you do, so let's say uh, I got some, some buffer. And then if you do lines on it, you're gonna get a list of all the lines. So you can count the lines by doing length, right? So you can say length lines of get contents and then you get the number of lines, right? If you want to uh, count the number of words, there is a function which splits all the text into words and gives you a list of all the words. And that one is called, not surprisingly, words. And again, you're gonna do length of words, right? And this way you can kind of account the list and then to, to, to count the, the length of all the characters, you just do length on the characters, right? So it's very trivial to do it in Haskell because it is kind of a trivial problem. And they have those utility methods for giving you the, um, uh, what you need to solve it. All right, so I will finish here. Um, and then if you need tests, you have to look into the repo to kind of get the pattern from there. And then if you have any questions, don't hesitate and, and ask the questions on the issue tracker. So that's all for today. Is IntelliJ the only ID you recommend for this course? Uh, no, it's up to you. I I'm using IntelliJ, but you should use whatever works for you, right? Uh, Visual Studio Code also has a Haskell uh, plugin, and you can use Vim or you can use whatever you like. Uh, yep. But IntelliJ is pretty good. Great. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. All the things.